Hello and welcome back to another Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. Luke Taylor here, and I. we are back, obviously. Um, my voice sounds a little bit uh, like a smoker. I've never smoked a day in my life, but here we go. But um, just kind of getting over that flu, what have you, and it's uh, made my voice uh, not... Uh, I guess I'm not doing many voiceovers, but uh, we're back. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Uh, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we're pretty active on those. And if you want to support us, uh, go to uh, www.patreon.com backsla- uh, backslash Cork and Taylor. Uh, and for as little as $7 a month, you can support the dream for total domination of the Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. So we got a fun guest. We are going, it's kind of interesting because I have a couple questions for him. And one we talked off the air about Ronaldo. We're talking to uh, Oscar Covedo Jr. or Oscar Covedo from Covedo uh, Wines in lovely Portugal. But if I look at the back of you right now, it doesn't look so lovely. You said you've had three weeks of rain. Hey, Ned, look, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. It's uh, it's a pleasure to to be part of your podcast that I have been following for for quite some time. And um, I kind of feel that I finally made it. So you have, thank you. You have. You have made it. I don't know. Uh, hopefully, if that's your bar for life, uh, I feel sorry for you. I pray for you. I pray for you on Sunday, Oscar. But um, I love – I sell your ports in Ohio. We've met. Um, obviously, we've had dinner in Chicago, or Cleveland with your with your sister. And um, I guess the most pressing, quest, pressing question I have – so I grew up in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. I went to St. Thomas Aquinas uh, Secondary School, a.k.a. High School. And we had a huge Portuguese contingency, like huge, like 50% were like Port- Portugal. Um, why was everybody in that school named Pereira, last name, or Ferreira? Is that a pretty common last name in Portugal? Actually, those um, last names related to Pereira means pear tree. Um, oh. And we have uh, many other last names related to somehow to nature. And those are old Jewish uh, last names. So at the time of Inquisition, um, we had a lot of a relatively big Jewish community in, uh, in our country. And in our neighbor country as well, Spain. So Interesting. The Jewish had to find ways uh, of um, pretending that they were uh, Catholic, and um, using changing their last name was one of the typical ways of finding that uh, made it through the what what could uh, bring the the Inquisition in their houses. So um, Pereira, Amendoeira, uh, Ferreira, uh, Macieira, it's the, the, all those names are are from from that time, and usually related to nature. And um, unfortunately, Inquisition uh, st- st- stopped too late, only in uh, in the 1750s, and uh, many Jewish had to leave the country before uh, they were otherwise they would be killed by Inquisition. And um, and maybe some of them migrated to to North America, as mm-hmm. a lot did after the Second World War. Interesting. We just learned history right there. <laughs> I feel like I just learned something. I'm starting off my Tuesday very knowledgeable. But um, <laughs> you guys have a really interesting story. So your family has been producing port for over five generations, but you just started – bottling under your label and what was it 1993 i think yep 1994 1993 1993 okay so what i guess why is that? five generations i mean that's long that's like that's long that's uh, <laughs> yeah that's um uh, it was a very unfortunate decision of the se- several portuguese governments so the duro valley was the first region in the world to be demarcated and regulated back in 1756. At that time, there were two other regions, one in Italy, Chianti, another one in Hungary, uh, Tokai, which were uh, delimited, but they were not regulated at the time in 1756. So the Portuguese were kind of uh, very innovative in that sense. They were protecting the, the name port and the product port so they could keep paying for the textiles they would buy from the uh, United Kingdom. 
with uh, with wine. And um, Portugal was also paying for political and political stability and uh, and uh, to the English army as uh, as the way to defend the, the Portuguese borders. And we had to accept, accept that the, the port trade would be organized, controlled by the British merchants. So the Duro Valley is about um, 100 miles east of the city of Porto, of the coast where the Atlantic Ocean uh, just uh, embraces the, the Portuguese um, city of Porto. But despite that uh, long uh, uh, distance between the, the location where we grow the grapes and where we make the port and the city of Porto, it was only allowed to export port wine from the city of Porto as the merchants could control the business. So families like mine and many others were not allowed to export. Actually, we only had a full hand of merchants that would be buying our ports and um, that uh, dependency on the on the merchants lasted until 1986 so 230 years later portugal decides to join the european union and it is the european union that forces portugal to open the market and stop with this monopoly uh, geographic monopoly for the exports of port so my family's life changed and uh, many other small family business start to show up after Portugal joins the European Union. At that time, of course, 100% of port was exported from, um, from the city of Porto or from Villanova de Gaia. Now it's only 97%. So in uh, almost 40 years, <laughs> the Doro produces uh, conquered three percent market share. Mm. Not wow. very impressive. Well, three percent is better than two percent. Look at it that way. Indeed. <laughs> you know, we got to always look at positives. So let me let me ask you this question then: Since England had such a monopoly and a monopoly, and um, I mean, you can see it in the names: Taylor Fladgate. I mean, some of these other big port uh, port houses. Were you cheering for France? or England in the World Cup in football? Um, I didn't, I, I, they, I watched that much and I couldn't take it aside, to be honest. And I'm now for Morocco. Would be great to see for the first time an <laughs> African country uh, winning the World Cup, despite they yeah. had uh, won against Portugal a few days ago. Right, 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 right. So how difficult, as one of the youngest port wine houses... How difficult, how big of a challenge was it for you guys? Um, it's still very difficult. <laughs> Every day it's yeah. not, I mean, it's easier probably the day before, much easier than at the time of our grandparents and uh, ancestors before. Um, but, you know, we basically, we now export 94% of our production. In these last okay. 30 years, we were able to kind of, totally changed the way we were selling our ports and uh, we were able to build up a market for our ports. But right. we still go outside and um, we are still very young family business. 100 years mm -hmm. is not that much in the port trade. Um, we are we have a Portuguese, actually from more of a Spanish, uh, a Latin last name. So it's not one of those uh, British uh, last names. But we are very proud of that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in a, in a small village with 2,000 people where I used to know every single person. And uh, the same way that you know the people that live in there, you also know the different terroirs of each single parcel. And somehow, you know, on your Saturday or Sunday walks out into the woods, taking your kids to breathe that... Uh, well oxygenized air you think that um, i can make this kind of wine from this parcel from that parcel i'll probably do something different and uh, that's um 
kind of a skill. I don't know if you can call it a skill, or at least we, we are exposed to this uh, in a way that uh, the winemakers, the big winemakers that live in the city uh, can't. So um, it's not, um, it's great to live in the countryside and to be small and uh, have small problems. Uh, at the same time, we, we can, uh, we probably can pay better for the grapes of the small growers that need it more, um, as long as you are able to make good wine from them. And if the whole thing mm -hmm. works, so if good grapes make good port, and if good port is sold to, at uh, good prices for for people that can value that, the whole uh, the whole system is working, and uh, we can improve not only our not only our life, but the life of the little community that is uh, is around us and supports us every day. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine growing up in a or living in a place with two thousand people and you know everybody. That could be good or bad. <laughs> well, um, sometimes it's not easy, you know, when we change your girlfriend or when uh, somehow you want, uh, you know, some other kind of intimacy. You don't. I mean, yeah, yeah, it has yeah. some good and bad things for sure. Yeah, it's a good bad things. What is it like? What is it like working with your father? And then also, how did they decide? How did they he decide your position and then your sister's position? Because one's the winemaker and one's not the winemaker. Yeah, I think he never. It really ne never, never, never decided what what we should do in the company. I think things happen naturally. Mm -hmm. So uh, Claudia joined the family business in 1999 as winemaker. She started studying at the university for analogy in 95, I guess. So when she took the decision, um, both uh, grandparents were against that idea. They couldn't see a lady being a winemaker and uh, thought that she sh should just take something uh, that would expose her less to, to, to a busy and uh, active life among uh, Gentlemen, she didn't really listen to them and decided to study, <laughs> follow her studies. So she then takes um, after at the end of the of the graduation, she worked for a short period of time for one of the big merchants, and decided to come to the family business to take over the role as a winemaker. At that time, the sales were being uh, controlled. I mean, uh, managed by my my father. And that was like that until 2009. So in 2009, at that time, I was working in Madrid in a, for, a, for a bank, for an American bank. And uh, my grandfather, who was my, my best friend, he passed away at the age of 93. Wow. And to me, uh, and I have no religion, I kind of see a, a light that tells me that my, my location, I mean, my, my life sh should no longer be in Madrid, working for a bank that I don't really know who the owners are or what's the you know the final purpose, the final goal of all that. And I told to my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, um, um, I'm gonna leave. I wanna I wanna go back to my little 2000 uh, inhabitant <laughs> uh, village San Juan da Pesqueira in the Douro Valley. And um, and I, when I communicate this to my family uh, at my parents' house, I thought it was a good idea to to tell my parents uh, I mean, before lunch. I thought about, you know, I'm going to tell everyone at lunchtime. So my parents, my my sister, my in law, my uh, my niece who was there as well. So I thought, well, let me just tell my parents before, and uh, at least they know when I when I raise this. Uh, conversation at, on, on, on lunch table. So I, I was kind of preparing my speech for like five minutes on what I'm going to tell my mother and father. And uh, finally, I just said, you know, um, grandpa just passed away and I think it's time for me to come back and help in the family business. And my father, he was doing something in the kitchen. He looks at me and says, okay. And he leaves. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that was not the welcoming reception that I would expect. But he was kind of somehow also setting the 
the, the standards for how the you know the procedures from now on. Uh, he was the boss. He was in charge, and uh, I would have to fight for my for my for the responsibility. I would have to uh, to be treated as um, as any other uh, of the employees of the company. So slowly, I, I was able to. I was focusing on the on the sale uh, on the sales of our uh, ports. That's how we met in in Ohio, and mm-hmm. um, you know, slowly things uh, were working well for the company. And my father in 2016 decide, decides to 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 quit and retire. So I think it was more the necessity that, uh, and also some. I think there's. I mean, there's a. Um, I love communicating to people and meeting people, and I love to do sales. And maybe Claudia, as a more of a engineer mind, more technical, more perfectionist, she's much better doing the the, the production side. But it, mm-hmm. it I mean, it, nothing was planned. It, things just happened by that this way. I wouldn't say by chance, but it was maybe the just the the nature that that. Um, put each one of us in, in the positions that, uh, that we have now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So did you have to, did you have to, uh, interview with your father for a job? No, no. Uh, he didn't want to do that. I think it would be too embarrassing for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. He was kind I still to, think he to... should have interviewed you. <laughs> I was still, a a young, yeah, uh, boy trying to figure out what I want to do f- for my life. And yeah. Maybe it didn't take me too serious when I said that I want to leave and help the family. Yeah. Yeah. And it's obviously worked out. How, how much we're going to, we're about to, we're going to try your white port, which is really unique. And people are like, wow, a white port. How much say do you kind of sit, have with your sister and vice versa when you're kind of, um, maybe offering advice or what have you, because I mean, you're selling the product. She's making the product. I guess how much crossover is there? Is there just pretty much you stay in your own lane and you push, you kind of sell what she makes and you know, she sells what, no. or you know, what have you? No, uh, you know, look, um, I have three kids and, uh, once I had my, my first kid, which was born on the 9th of October. So towards the end of the harvest, uh, my sister looked at my eyes and she says, this is the last time you have a kid during the harvest. Next time you got to plant it better. So she loves, she really wants me to be also involved in the production side. I think this is, she's seven years older than me, so she's kind of a bossy sometimes. Um, and um, it, she she believes that the, the and I do, I agree with her, the, the, the input, it's very important that we bring the input from outside. So uh, we, we all can understand how the our consumer, what the consumer expects when buy, when opens a bottle of, uh, of our ports or our wines. It is, um, and I believe it should be the same way from inside to out. And uh, I always challenge Claudia to, to visit the market and get to know, get to talk to the people. We receive a lot of visitors from outside and somehow that exposes already to what uh, what's the, the preferences of the consumer. But someone that is visiting us already has some, somehow biased as, as they know that what we are making and they probably fell in love with our style. But when we land in, uh, in Ohio and uh, you get to pour the wine to the a random uh, wine drinker that maybe never tasted port before and you can mm-hmm. feel you can you can see you can the reaction to the people that that's worth a lot it's valuable feedback that uh, that can help us make things better and one of the things that we make different from other companies other other wine producers is that we like to have our ports a little bit less sweet than the average and this is a is a is a family style once i asked my grandfather why was that and he told me sugar is like a makeup and 
in port we have fructose, but it tastes like sweetness, like sugar. So if you believe in your in your grapes, if you believe in the fruit that you are pressing and from what you're making your ports, you don't need so much sweetness. A lower level of sweetness is going to leave more room for the expression of your wine. So that's why we like to make a less sweet style of port. Mm. And you kind of validate that with the consumer in the end. Me personally, is, I mean, is this still uh, val- is this still relevant for nowadays, or it was maybe just forty or fifty years ago? And um, one of the conclusions that I got was that everyone, or almost a, a lot of people, love uh, Pedro Jimenez PX, which is a very very sweet style of uh, sherry wine. But we all have one, no more than two sips, and then we need something else to drink. So if you make a port that is very very sweet you'll quickly get tired of it. While if you're making it one that's more on the drier side, you know, you'll have more expression of your fruit, more expression of the port, and you don't get tired so fast. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. Well, let's talk about this. Let's, I'm going to try this white port. Tell me, tell me about it. I mean, it's, it's, you don't see much white port in, at least in the American market. So, um, white port was um, is something relatively recent. It has uh, the, the 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 white vines have a long, long past in the Dura Valley, but at the time of the demarcation, in seventeen fifty six, the the king also forbade the use of white grapes for port production, as he believed that the the grapes, the white grapes, would dilute the the quality of um, of the red port people in the Doro never never accept it so we would plant um uh, two or three percent of uh white grapes white white vines in um uh, in the middle of the of the reds and there were two or three reasons for that one was that um the the white grapes most of the time are early ripeners so once you have a a rotten grape in the vineyard, the birds are going to eat those grapes. And they would eat the white grapes and leave the reds uh, finishing the ripeness. Another reason is that white grapes help to soften the tannins. They have very little tannins, as you know. And uh, the Doro uh, grapes in general are heavier in tannins because of the of the relatively dry weather that we have in the Toro. Um, and the berries tend to be small with a, a high level of tannin. When we press these grapes in the lagar, which is a, you know, a open, old stony, stone open tank where grapes are food trodden, we are going to extract a lot of tannins. So having a little bit of white to soften those tannins helps the port to get a bit smoother and more elegant. And the third reason is that the, um, the white port has a high, or sorry, the white grapes ha- uh, have higher levels of acidity when uh, harvested earlier. So it also helps to balance the city, acidity in the, in the port must, in the red port must. Eventually, time passed and the um, port was only being produced from red grapes and uh, red port was the was the most important uh, was the only drink drink uh, enjoyed uh, all over the world actually mr coburn which was one of one of the most famous uh, merchants he used it to to say that the first duty of port is to be red this was about 100 years ago but um, the consumer was uh, asking for lighter wines in general and uh, eventually about uh, in the 19, uh, 1920s 1930s um, small productions of white port were being um, uh, produced and uh, sold to, to the, in the local market with relatively success so slowly we can see more and more white port coming to the market nowadays it's still slow it is small it's about uh, 10% of the total sales but we can see that the the growth is 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 um is taking off 
Um, we have now not only the the three year old blend of white port that you we are tasting today, but also a ten year uh, and a thirty year uh, white port blends. So these are two different consumers as we have different levels of aging, but uh, and especially those last two, the ten and the thirty, are to drink by the glass. While uh, a younger white port you can uh, use as a base for a long drink mixing it with tonic water with a zest of lemon and a couple of ice cubes if you want to make it a long drink. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, you've actually made it, made it uh, with tonic water for me. That's nice. I, I love, I love white port. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's really nice. Actually, we have a, a, a customer of ours, uh, Raj in Car, uh, Carfanias in Columbus. He's a huge proponent of your, uh, of your line. He was actually there this summer. Uh, I guess you were taking a siesta or something like that. You were, you were sleeping, so you couldn't see. And I guess his son lives out there too. You know his son. I can't think of his name. I do. Um, he's, you he's do, in yeah. Porto now. Yeah. 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 He's, uh, yeah. he's loving it. And Raj was out there for, I think, two weeks and he was, like it's gorgeous out there. I mean, you see the photos. I gotta get over there myself, and um, it is absolutely b- beautiful in Portugal, and very friendly people. I mean, like I said, I went to high school with a lot of the port, a lot of Portuguese, and just very welcoming, very friendly. Um, yeah, and you can kind of see it in your ports. They're very welcoming. All right, so we do this section called sip and spit. And it's usually a bonus section, but we're gonna we're gonna mix it up here. You win nothing, you get nothing. It's sponsored by no one because no one really cares. So they're kind of quick answers, and I'm gonna sip on your special reserve uh, tawny port. And we can talk about that at the end, and then kind of wrap up. But they're just quick questions, um, and uh, just say what comes to your head, to your mind, to your head. All right, first question: the wine you make and sell that best describes you. Uh, vintage port. You're old or what? No, vintage port. A young vintage port has um, a lot of uh, everything. Has a dark color, uh, intense flavors, um, a bit um, of unpolished tannins, a bit harsh tannins. But it's a it's a mm-hmm. concentration of um, of. Um, what the fruit can really give you when it's fresh and it's young and it's uh, intense. And um, it's the, the bottle of port that you would put aside if you want to age it for several decades. And it has different stages. And uh, I'm no longer at the, at the stage of the young two-year-old vintage port. I'm already getting more mature. And, um, you know, as I get old. But um, I think that it, it, I, I, I still believe that the vintage port is the the most difficult wine to produce because it represents the best that you can make in a certain harvest. And uh, if we always put our efforts to produce small quantity of something very special, we will end up with uh, with um, with a bottle of wine that's drink it's it's in great conditions to drink throughout throughout uh, many decades and that's how i hope i will be i uh, i hope to be useful at different uh, uh, times of the of the family uh, company and uh, that i can last at least three or four more decades like a, a bottle of vintage port nice it's supposed to be quick answers but thank you oscar uh, <laughs> the best advice anyone ever gave you re- the best advice anyone ever gave you relating to the wine business In vino veritas, and that's not really an advice. Is a is a is a Roman. I think was a a Roman uh, philosopher that uh, that said that. The um, sign. It's a sign over there behind you. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, don't try to lie. Uh, with the time, um, alcohol and. Uh, uh, I mean, you will have to speak the truth uh, when you are uh, sober and you are not. So, yeah. <laughs> I like that. So don't drink too much is what you're saying. No, always tell the truth. And you don't have to remember yeah. what uh, what you told. Right. Okay. Biggest misconception about port. 
that is for old people. Okay. Hardest vintage. 2021. Last year. Ooh. Interesting. Why? Uh, we are in the middle of uh, uh, re uh, rebuilding our winery and expanding it. And uh, it was just a nightmare. Having like the cranes and the forklifts and next to the, you know, the diggers and the hammers and... Is it over yet? No, I still have six months. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, let's talk about some positive. Best vintage or year for Coveto? 11, 2011. Okay. Any reason why? 11, we had a concentration of uh, like cold winter, uh, very generous rain during the winter, a mild and relatively dry spring, some showers uh, during the very hot months of uh, July and August, a uh, small uh, production that just brought amazing grapes with a lot of color, a lot of intensity of flavor, a lot of texture. Um, I mean, everything that we were making was just so good that uh, it's it's unforgettable. You could see that the minute you, sque you squeeze the grapes, you could start pressing the grapes, crushing the grapes. I mean, it was just, just amazing. And uh, I don't think, um, I don't know I if mean, I will see another vintage like that again. If it was that good, you could have been the winemaker that year and you could have made Claudia the uh, head of sales and marketing. Anyone. You and me, look, would be a great team. Yeah, it sounds like it. So here's a good question here. If someone did a Hollywood movie about your family, who would play you, who would play your sister, and who would play your parents? Wow. Who would play me? And honestly, for your sister, this will give me a good idea of, you know, you said she's kind of bossy, so I'll be kind of curious to who you pick for your sister. Um, for me, I would probably pick uh, uh, I think uh, <laughs> maybe the guy that makes the mask, what's his name? Um, Jim Carrey? That, Jim Carrey, exactly. Jim Carrey is, okay. um, is someone that you, you cannot take too serious. Uh, you know, okay. he's a guy that likes to be in different places at the same time. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, him for Claudia, for Claudia. Um, that's a tough question for Claudia. Um, would play for Claudia. She's a kind of a relatively serious uh, girl, and we don't have that many of, uh, of serious actresses uh, anymore. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, so so maybe, maybe she'd Julia, start. Julia maybe Roberts. She'd, okay, or maybe she'd play herself. Maybe she'd play herself. <laughs> you know? It's so difficult. Okay, what about your parents? Uh, my parents. Maybe Robert De Niro for my father. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's a good one. And uh, mom. Who would play my mom? Um, who would play my mom? Um, maybe Meryl Streep. I don't know. Ooh, okay. Okay. I like that. You didn't have a tough time with your parents or yourself, but your sister, you struggled. So that's okay. <laughs> your favorite wine region outside of Portugal. Mm, uh, I'll probably go for uh, Chateau Neuf du Pape. Okay. Any I reason why? Chat 
yeah, which I don't know for pre rat. Um, I, I like the the full body, full bodied intense. Uh, somehow over some sometimes uh, overripe uh, notes, um, wines that can age for several years, that are made with the local varieties that are better adapted to their climate. Uh, yeah.